Hey, welcome back, everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're on the ground at the Cosmopolitan Resort in downtown Las Vegas. It's 120 degrees outside, perfect for a conversation about IoT and industrial internet where you can't be in a beautifully air-conditioned, uh, taking care of data center all the time. So, okay. we're really excited to be joined by our next guest who's been playing in this field for a long time. It's Hema Bukalama. He likes to just go by Hema, likes Bono and yeah. Brittany and, and uh, share all the famous people. So, welcome uh, to theCUBE. Thank the you. Thank you. So, interesting conversation. You said yeah. you just come off a lot of partner conversations yeah. here. We were commenting for a company doing their first developer conference to have yeah. 1,700 people show up. Yep. Pretty impressive uh, feat, and obviously you need a partner ecosystem. So, what were some of the conversations with the partners you were having? Absolutely, and, and I've been in the Valley for long enough, and I attended the first Java one, and it was as small as this. And that's what I'm thinking of, where we'll be in 10 years, right? I think one of the key things about a platform is, and that's what Harrell talked about in the morning, we don't do all of it, right? It's an ecosystem play, partners have to add to it. And so the conversations I was having was with a, a group of partners who had APIs on top of the platform. And so one example is, um, a good example, a good need in the cloud space is monetization and metering, right? If you think about, if I'm a service provider, how do I know who's using what how do I segment the customers and give them different price points and sort of dynamic pricing? Right. And so one of the partners I talked to was, give them an API, you as a service provider or an application provider, just call their API, go to their portal, look at the analytics on who's using what, and change the pricing. Right. And that's one example. The second example partner I talked to was um, anomaly detection. A lot of the industrial use cases are about detecting anomalies in the data. You don't want to write that from scratch as a developer, right? So this partner gives you an API, you push the data, they sort of do the anomaly detection, they give you the outcomes. And so we're trying to talk, have this conversation about how do developers get access to the APIs so that they can take down the development time from months to weeks to days. Right. Yeah. And the other play, you've been around for a long time, is, yeah. is nobody buys a platform, right? Yeah. They buy applications to solve Absolutely. business problems. So if you don't have an application Absolutely. store, you can never kind of get to the, to yeah. the platform nirvana yeah. that you're trying to get to. Yeah. And nobody can do it all. So, you know, as we see in all the shows we go yeah. to, we go to a lot of shows, yeah. Yeah. ecosystem is really, really important. No one company can, can do it all. Uh, absolutely, and I know, I've been on the other side of the spectrum where we tried to do a platform, it didn't work, right? Because it's a hard sell. What's actually very different with our space is it's much harder. Because if you go talk to a uh, VP of operations or any CEO of an industrial company, they care about two outcomes. How do I reduce my unplanned downtime and increase productivity? They don't care what's the platform underneath right, that, right? Right, right. So it's all no about, line item budget for yeah, platform. <laughs> exactly. It's all about am I managing my assets better? Am I monitoring them better? And am I leveraging them to make more revenue, right? More, uh, make more power, may, uh, make the trains go longer. And so to make that happen, we cannot scale as fast as the market needs us to. Right. Because right? the developers are trying to build these applications at a pace that is unprecedented. You know, Scott from Microsoft, he made this statement in the keynote today. It is the coolest job today to be a developer. Right. right? And, and in this context, you have so many developers just trying to do a lot of cool things and so the partner ecosystem just accelerates that you know, path to market faster. Right. Yeah. The tough challenge for you guys though, which you're obviously having some success yeah. against, is everybody's competing yeah. for the developer. Yep. Microsoft's competing for the yeah. developer. You know, Amazon's competing for the, everybody yeah. wants the, the, yeah. the, the developer. And I just, I, I love kind of the, the GE commercials now that yeah. they run on television yeah. with yeah. The, the software guy that, that's trying to convince <laughs> yeah. his friends he's not working yeah. on load of mocha, yeah. he's actually working on software. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what is, you know, how are you selling that into developers? What's really the thing that's hooking them to get so many of them here for this inaugural? Event. I know, it's, I have a funny story to tell. I went to Stanford Engineering School for recruitment the first year I joined. I was there for an hour, not a single developer and How long ago was this? Four years. Okay. We did the same earlier this year. You won't believe how much interest there is. I think what's happened is, the, the sort of the trend of IoT has become, the market has become more aware, but then people understand industrial IoT is a problem by itself. Like, it's a different scale. So what we are telling the customer, developers, it's a cool thing to do. You know, as technologists in the Valley, what do you care about? Is it a cool technology that I'm going to develop, and do I make a real outcome? Right. With this, with Predix, we're able to tell the developers you do both. 
cutting edge of technology. We're talking about blockchain. Uh, we're talking about microservices. So we're talking about technologies that are there out there, uh, you know, ahead of the market. And, and the second one is the key to success in the industrial space is customer interaction. Because, you know, I walked into a, um, uh, a locomotive remanufacturing facility thinking I could do a mobile app with touch screen. I found out they're wearing gloves. <laughs> touch screens don't work. Right, right. And then they're looking at virtual reality kind of a thing. And so the actual customer sort of feedback and how they use it is pushing us to do a lot of cool stuff. And so that's what we're, one part of telling the developer is, this is real, you got a lot of new cool APIs, it accelerates the development you need to do. And then the second part of it is, you know, the outcomes, the business outcomes. Being a technologist in the valley, having built platforms, I've always been intrigued by what is the real customer outcome. Right, right. With Predix, you're so much closer to the customer outcome because you're sort of merging the, the sort of the physics and the, math, and, the, and the math and delivering outcomes closer to the customer. Yeah. yeah. And as you said, you're, you're working with all the same tools. You're yeah. working with open source. I've already, we've been here for you know, a couple hours. We're already talking about Docker. Yeah. We're talking about microservices. Yeah. We're talking about all the stuff that yeah. you hear about at every other yeah. conference, whether it's EMC World or VM World yeah. or Oracle yeah. Open World or you know, it's the same types of technologies really bringing to bear. But it's funny, your perspective, you've been around for a while, as you've got more exposed to the, the operations technology yeah. side of the house, right, and this integration of the two, what's kind of your, your thought as, as, as you've kind of brought your IT experience yeah. into this existing world? Like I said, they're wearing gloves, yeah. right? It's harsh environments, it's not all super controlled. I, you know, as an engineer, by, you know, by degree, by profession, we like to touch things, right? Um, in, in code is very virtual, right? What, what I've lo loved in um, the first year I was here, I visited an airplane manufacturing facility, right? And I saw how it was being built, how software can make a change. So for me, switching on to the operation side gave me a real perspective of what things are really used for. My previous life was building banking software. You know, there's nothing to touch in a bank. I'm right, still right. Teaching, right? And so for, I think that's what's been in, uh, interesting for me. And when we, talk, we talked about uh, Owen, that's exactly how my team felt when we started here. Everyone would ask us, what do you do at GE? <laughs> you know, they don't do software, they build airplane engines, right? right? right. But once we start telling them the story about how the, out, the kind of outcomes, right? Make a plane go faster, train go faster, make more power. These outcomes tend to rhyme with developers because I think software has come to a place where, you know, I use this metric. 80% of the software that gets written doesn't get used, right? In this space, the customer don't let us do that because they're driven by bottom line and top line. Right. And when they're driven by that so much, you have to show them real value and then you only do work that adds value. Right. And, and so that's been the interesting transition for me from this pure software world to a merged space where you get to see real outcomes. Right, you get to touch, it's metal, yeah. right? It's yeah. big, big yeah. machine. Yeah. Yeah. It all, all, everybody likes big yeah. machines, right? right? From the time you're a little yeah. three-year-old, everybody Absolutely. likes the big truck that goes by. And it's easier for me to tell my daughter what I do now. <laughs> <laughs> like, what do you do? Oh, you're flying to uh, on a vacation, I make that plane run go faster. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Well, let's shift gears a little bit on, yeah. again on, you know, there's such, such great connectivity between yeah. IT and OT in your yeah. past life. You, you've got a, a, a patent on, on, it's a very long title, people can go check it out on LinkedIn, but the, the part that jumped out to me was the occasionally connected yeah. devices. And we think about all these value chains and now these software yeah. chains, and it's an API world, yeah. and it's an app world, and it's connected to the cloud, and there's all this stuff. Well, sometimes the connections just don't stay. But stuff's got to still happen, yeah. something's got to happen, yeah. things got to continue to work. Yeah. So how have you kind of taken that yeah. experience and, and applied that in, in this OT space? So it's interesting you mentioned that, right? When we started Predix, people thought we were a cloud platform. We are not. We are what we call as an edge to cloud platform. Edge is all about disconnected world. If you go back to even two years back, the operational side was completely air-gapped there was no connectivity between that operational side and the, you know, the cloud side. Now when we try to open it up, right, it doesn't mean they're always connected because the operating environments, deep sea oil rig, you only have satellite connection at very exorbitant prices for a short time. And so you may have connection, but you don't want to burn your dollars with all the connection. So the occasionally connected sort of applies into this industrial world a lot as much as mobile because here, price is premium, connectivity is premium. 
And so what we are starting to do is give them the capabilities to build these applications where they can assume that there's no connectivity, store the data locally, run analytics locally. And so what we talked about in the keynote this morning is this notion of a digital twin. How do you take that digital twin and move that to the edge? And when it's in the edge, it is not connected to the cloud. It may be connected occasionally, but when you're completely disconnected, how do you still use all the analytics? How do you still do all the outcomes? And I'll give you a good example. In the past world, when you want to make more power, you would have to send the data to the uh, cloud or somewhere in the local m and center and run an analytic that says make more power or not, right? When you make more power, the lifing degrades because you got to operate at a higher temperature. Right, right. We push that analytic with all the data to the edge. Now you can make the decision on, do I optimize on the lifing or the power production based on how much money you're going to make. So this is this notion of disconnected nature at the edge so that you're making decisions in real time where uh, the data is and where the assets are. So I, I come from a mobile space. We thought of disconnected in the mobile space. It was a sort of a com similar transition into industrial space. You know, the technologies are almost similar. We have a database that runs on the edge. We have a database that runs in the cloud. You have to occasionally sync the data. The kinds of data are different, the volume is different, but it's a similar model, right? So, That's interesting. You're the first one that kind of tied it back to a mobile, which is such an easy yeah. analogy because yeah. we all carry it in our, in our pocket, Absolutely. right? Sometimes it's connected, yeah. sometimes it's not. Yeah. Sometimes you work independently, sometimes you're on the web. Absolutely. At some point in time, they get resynced up again. Exactly. So when you're when someone's kind of starting this journey, yeah. say it's an old line company, they've got good systems, they work, everything's working. Yeah. Where do they start? Do they do they start with the edge device? Do, do you put a little bit of compute and store yeah. next to things? Yeah. Is it do you start with the low hanging fruit on what you can send to the actual cloud? How do how do they kind of sort through the yeah. decision tree to figure out what goes where when? And, and so that's an interesting question because we see customers in every different segment. Like, some of them are very comfortable with data moving to the cloud, right? Healthcare has done that, transportation has done that. There are some businesses which are heavily regulated, which they want to keep the data in the operational environment. So it's sort of driven by the use case and their comfort of how far can they go with sort of going beyond what they've done, right? Right, right. The easiest approach, what we tell people is, if you already are collecting data in the cloud, and I say in the cloud, it's sort of a not real cloud, but um, today we have MND centers, monitoring and diagnostic centers for our wind turbines. So that data is already being sent to some central location. In that case, what we tell them is, collect, extend the data, write analytics on that data so that you're delivering this predictive maintenance capabilities. So that's an easy transition to do pure cloud. In some cases, where they don't have any edge sort of data collection, we ship with and we demoed this in the keynote today, we have a box that they can um, put right next to their asset. Could be a turbine, could be a jet engine, and then collect the data, and then do some local analytics, and you have nothing to do with the cloud. And then you just manage all of these assets, right? So it's been a combination of which is the customer, what domain they are in, how regulated they are, and sort of then decide based on the use case. The other thing we tell them is don't go big, right? Um, <laughs> It's just hard coming from GE, right? Yeah. We think everything from yeah. GE is big. I know. <laughs> and so telling the industrial guys, <laughs> absolutely, don't go, don't go big, right? And it's good that, you know, um, Jeff and uh, our leadership was thinking of fast works and lean and sort of pushing that message within the organization. Now we are sort of leveraging the same thing and saying, hey, this is software. We are a lot more agile than any of what you've seen. Right. So let's go incremental gains. Let's find out the smaller values. So start with, like you said, small edge or small cloud, and then grow that as you show more outcomes. Yeah, yeah. it's great, because everybody we've talked to yeah. has a big software background yeah. at, at GE. It, yeah. It's amazing that they've done such a good job building team yeah. bringing in really yeah. software DNA. Yeah. And that said, you're in big industrial heavy stuff that's been running a long time, but yeah. you're still kind of pushing the edge. And I want to bring up a topic we talked yeah. about when you first walked up, and that's blockchain. Yeah. Um, a lot of stories on Bitcoin, everybody kind of knows the story of Bitcoin, whatever, I always think yeah. Bitcoin is an application, blockchain is a platform, but we're really seeing Absolutely. a lot of investment of effort in, in at least conversations yeah. on the yeah. blockchain front yeah. from IBM, SAP, Absolutely. and you guys. What's your kind of take on, on the potential for blockchain 
kind of the timing for blockchain. How do you see, where does it fit, and what's the timing on how it's going to yeah. slowly increase its importance in the marketplace? I mean, and you and I talked about this before, it just caught fire like crazy in the last three months. You know, the conferences are, have gone from 20 people to 1,000 people in less than like three months. Um, what's interesting is this whole transformation that the industrial economy is going through, the companies are going through, it's enabling us to sort of insert these technologies which by themselves are hard to digest, but now we are telling them, you're going distributed, right? Critics is a distributed architecture. As part of that, but let's think about a distributed like ledger so that um, we were talking about an aviation use case. When a, a plane comes into a you know, service, it, the service is actually done by at least 20 different companies. Very manual, and there's one centralized sort of uh, reconciliation of all of that. Now we're telling them, ignore the centralized reconciliation, run a distributed blockchain, and then each of you gets to know all the transactions that have been done in the blockchain and non repudiated so that you all can be verified on what you've done. They're like, hmm, that's interesting. I've never thought about it. How does it reduce my OPEX? How does it reduce my CAPEX? And so it's triggering those thoughts because it's no longer about, oh my God, that's a new technology. Right. We've have, we have sort of crossed that bridge with the cloud sort of transition. And so that's one example of uh, where we are seeing um, the uh, adoption of blockchain. The other interesting thing that's much closer is the digital twin. The whole point of digital twin is you have a virtual model of the asset and all the configuration changes it's going through are captured somewhere. But what's key in the service industry like ours, it has to be attested by someone. Applying blockchain when the servicing of that particular asset is done by multiple players and each of them is being verified is awesome. That way, then the technology sort of a curve is lower in terms of how much investment you have to make, and then there's complete non-repudiation on that. Right. So I, I think from a, just a timeline standpoint, I think the next six months are going to be like really strong POCs, uh, and, and you know, it, people might call it early adoption curve, but the next six months is where I see you know, proving out that this applies. Mid, mid, to, early, uh, mid to late 2017, is when I think uh, we'll see the larger adoptions and real projects. You, you made a really interesting comment yeah. about, about once everybody kind of got over the hump with accepting cloud, yeah. now suddenly they're pretty open to trying new technologies. Absolutely. My yeah. buddy uh, Gary Ornstein from MemSQL tweeted yeah. to me during the keynote, yeah. Jeff, what databases are they talking about? You yeah. know, you're at Sybase. I'm like, yeah. Gary, they're talking about every database. Yeah. It's really, you know, kind of horses yeah. from courses depending yeah. on the application. So Absolutely. the ability to uh, adopt, integrate, yeah try yeah. lots of new technology seems to be really taken off within the industrial space. I mean, I, mean, I think uh, people think it's a lot of, the transformation is a lot of technical, but it's actually a lot cultural, right? To make them think about change and technology and cloud, how do you make them think as a culture, change is acceptable, right? right. Because they're so resistant to change, because if you go look at FD um, um, airlines and how much uh, verification they have to do, they're not acceptable of change. And so it's a part half technical, half cultural, and you get them to the cultural change, accepting the cultural change. Technology is like, it, it, it's easy. It's not hard, as hard as it used to be. Right, right. That's funny, because we say it all the time. It's people, process, and yeah. tech. And the yeah. tech's actually the easy. Yeah. Yeah. The people and process is yeah. the hard part. Yeah. And what we're finding out with the cloud transition is the people, right? Like typical traditional IT, they, don't, they may not have a role now. If it's all cloud, what are they managing? Are they managing systems? No, because the cloud manages it. Now everyone's thinking like, I'm going to write code. I'm a developer. That's the transition we are going through. Right. Yeah. All right, Heem, I give you the last word, running out of time, yeah. top two priorities for the next six months. Digital twin and the edge. And then I'm going to add a third one, because we mentioned it in the keynote, service availability. So we call it service quality, service availability. The true trust for a cloud is the uptimes. All right. Those are the three main areas. We'll keep an eye on that and we'll yeah. check in with you again right. at uh, Minds of Machines later this All year. Right. All Thank right, Hima, thanks for stopping by. Nice talking to you. All right, Bye. I'm Jeff Rick. You're watching theCUBE. We are in uh, Las Vegas at the lovely Cosmopolitan Hotel. Thanks for watching. Thanks.